Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Rafiq Bal, and in today's show, we'll be deliberating on two very important topics. The first segment being Pakistan and IMF talks. Uh, in that regard, um, this relates to Pakistan's economy and the different aspects of it. As we know, Finance Minister Mohammad Aurangzeb had earlier said that um, uh, Pakistan needs a newer and a longer program with the IMF, a bailout package, so as to conclude with the economic reforms that the government is willing to undertake. And um, he also mentioned uh, some crucial economic reforms that the government wants to undertake, such as in the realm of taxation, such as increasing the country's exports, and in other domains as well, uh, regarding energy and other industries as well. That's what the finance minister stated. And these are the reforms that need to be undertaken that he said uh, for the economic uh, scenario of the country to improve. Um, in that regard, talks between Pakistan and the IMF a team for an extended fund facility. These talks will be held in the coming days uh, regarding Pakistan's newer and longer program with the IMF. Of course, IMF does also have some conditions and they are uh, asking for reforms in certain sectors. And of course, uh, these, are, uh, these are the different deliberations that the IMF team and the Pakistan side will be deliberating on during their discussions. And of course, uh, the statement from IMF also um, uh, which said that uh, accelerating reforms now is more important than the size of the program uh, quote unquote this was said by the IMF side and uh, the finance minister Mohammad Aurangzeb after the statement said that after the loan program has been finalized uh, with the International Monetary Fund he would also request for additional funding under the Resilience and Sustainable Trust. We'll be deliberating on these uh, different uh, topics. And in the second segment, uh, we'll be talking about India and the elections there. Uh, moving on to our first segment, um, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing the different uh, scenarios and different aspects of uh, Pakistan and IMF discussions. In that regard, uh, we have uh, been joined by geopolitical analyst Raja Faisal in the studios with us. And uh, we have been uh, joined by Dr. Mahmoud Khalid, who is an economist. He is also in the studio with us and along with that we have been joined by senior analyst Farooq Patafi who is with us on Skype. Thank you for being part of the show as well. I'd like to thank all of you uh, for being here and uh, being part of this discussion. I'll begin my uh, conversation from uh, Dr. Mahmoud Khalid and uh, take his views what he thinks regarding the recent talks between Pakistan and the IMF and uh, Pakistan's need for a newer and longer bailout package. What's your views on that? Well, actually, Pakistan has just completed the nine-month standby arrangement facility in which all the conditions were met. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means that Pakistan had been on the right track, whatever IMF has suggested as a creditor. Uh, but since uh, these programs cannot be of uh, short-term nature, they have to actually carry on. So in that spirit, uh, Pakistan is again looking forward to go to IMF to engage in a slightly longer and a bit more loaded in terms of the assistance package. Mm. Now, having said that, uh, we have to remember that it's not always the amount which is important when we go to the IMF. It's actually kind of anchoring because that anchor helps us to go to the rest of the international capital markets from where we can actually fund for our development needs. Now, having said that, what actually needs to be seen is that what IMF is now expecting from Pakistan and as you have rightly mentioned that they are still asking for a good reform package which is not just uh, some short term measures rather thinking about the future in which the sustainability is embedded. Having said that they are also considering some risks which actually are not in the control of Pakistan's management like for example the climate uh, shocks which are uh, devastating countries like Pakistan, uh, the commodity uh, pricing which actually follows the international price markets and these sort of things. So overall we are looking forward for the engagement with the IMF so that we can continue on the reforms as well as create a kind of a credibility towards the rest of the world that Pakistan is now good for business, it's good for investment and this is how we should proceed. Right, uh, including for Qadhafi in the conversation, as we know that uh, the masses of Pakistan, the local populace, it has, uh, it has uh, faced the brunt of inflation as uh, the different parts of the world people have. 
um, due to the different regional and global dynamics. Uh, but considering Pakistan's perspective, um, on one end there's the inflation-stricken people, and on the other end there's uh, some crucial reforms that need to be undertaken. How could the government balance these two and uh, facilitate the people as well as um, uh, heed to the demands from the IMF? Right. Uh, thank you very much, Rafe, for uh, this question. Let me ask you, uh, let me actually tell you that uh, when you talk about the economy of Pakistan, I'm sorry, my own voice is coming back in my ear, so I'll have to reduce the, uh, you know, um, earphones. But regarding the overall economic situation, I think that everybody agrees that Pakistan eventually has to once again go back to IMF. Why? Because, as was pointed out, that it, it is not merely the financial support, but the anchoring support or the certification, so to speak, that Pakistan is on the way to recovery, that is very important. But uh, then there are problems regarding the ability of the state to levy taxes, to collect taxes, to, uh, to be able to actually ensure that it can uh, meet the deficit uh, targets. That becomes a, a serious issue. So usually what happens, even uh, the fund actually asks Pakistan to go for the low-hanging fruit. For example, actually collecting taxes or levying more taxes to the salary class, uh, or for that matter, actually adding more uh, layers to or more amount to GST. So these are, uh, you know, the kind of demands we often actually encounter. But when you actually keep in mind the um, inflation figures and the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, cost of living crisis it has actually uh, generated. So th all these problems actually keep on mounting. So Pakistani government uh, will have to negotiate with IMF uh, uh, with all the dimensions in mind and it will have to highlight that there are certain uh, areas if you keep on actually trying to uh, you know, push Pakistan in that direction, maybe there will be counterproductive results for the economy. Uh, for example, uh, you know, because of inflation, people are losing, uh, you know, jobs. Uh, people are unable uh, to carry on with their lives. Um, and if you add taxes, that means that a significant portion of their uh, salaries will go away. So is there a possibility that one should actually keep in mind? I think one, one should. But regarding the IMF's own uh, emphasis, that money is not that much important. What is important at this moment is the speed or pace of reform. I mean, of course, you are going to expect that from the IMF. But in the end, uh, while we have to actually look at reform, uh, we have to also ensure that the economy uh, remain solvent and it is actually leading us towards some kind of good growth number that will ensure that people's needs are met. So as you pointed out, there is this dire need for balancing between the three aspects. One, uh, the need for reform. Um, uh, number two, the IMF's demand of doing more and then ensuring that economy does not totally collapse. So we'll have to see how the finance uh, ministry and finance team actually negotiates through those tough waters. Right, um, uh, right. and Roger Faisal, what's your take on, of course, we're going um, to negotiate a new program with the IMF. It is, going to, uh, it is going to affect different domains of the country's economy, whether it be industry, uh, whether it be the energy sector, whether it be uh, different sectors of the Pakistan's economy. And uh, it's, it's obviously going to have impact on uh, the local population of uh, Pakistan as well. Um, with that, how do you see uh, these, uh, these, uh, the new bailout package that we're looking to secure from the IMF in the longer term and in the shorter term? Yeah. Uh, but Rafi, obviously, if we look at uh, the kind of uh, e economic situation we are facing and we are going through right now in the country, of course, uh, uh, since almost three years, Pakistan has been uh, you know, fighting uh, to recover reason being uh, we shouldn't be forgetting that the uh, the time we had during uh, uh, the covid it actually not only pakistan but throughout the world all of the countries they were hit by that time and we shouldn't be forgetting that uh, ukraine crisis it has actually uh, further uh, fueled uh, uh, you know the menace 
and uh, of course when it comes to pakistan pakistan had to go to imf to of course sustain all of the pressures which uh, its economy is facing and after the bailout package as we ha as we are seeing and the earlier dr mahmood uh, you know very rightly pointed out that we are going towards uh, thinking about going towards another 6 uh, to 8 billion dollars uh, in uh, a fresh plan mm. uh, from uh, imf and i think uh, that's the way to go but of course uh, if we are uh, you know heading towards that for uh, in response to sustain further pressures because there will be more pressures getting more loans mm. it would be more pressure on our economy but how we can sustain that pressure uh, there are uh, certain uh, you know steps that uh, government would be taking and that it, one of them is to increase the volume of uh, the economy the the current economy the volume of the economy needs to be increased hmm. tax net needs to be increased uh, increased and of course privatization the uh, non productive sides uh, which s still are, uh, you know, uh, lingering on with the mm. government and, of course, taxpayer exchequer, uh, it is being affected by that. I think uh, we need to get rid of that. And, of course, whatever we can get out of it, we simply should get out of it and uh, uh, we should uh, make it part of our economy. Mm. Then there are, uh, uh, you know, certain avenues from where we can, of course, uh, uh, you know, increase uh, uh, our economy. Uh, of course, we know that I, uh, SIFC is working on uh, uh, minerals, working on uh, uh, the agriculture sector as well to mm. increase and enhance. We shouldn't be forgetting that we have natural uh, buyers of our uh, agriculture products, that is Middle East. And now, mm. uh, good news is that, of course, uh, uh, you know, our, our institutions, they are, uh, of course, highlighting uh, a fact and that is that uh, we are willing to uh, connect ourselves with the Central Asian Republics. Once we are connected to Central Asian Republics through Afghanistan, then that would, uh, you know, open up a new horizon for mm -hmm. uh, uh, our economy. And uh, in that context, I believe uh, we can easily, uh, uh, you know, increase the volume of our economy and we shouldn't be forgetting that there are uh, certain uh, s uh, sort of uh, sectors like IT sector. Mm. Uh, I mean, work can be done in that as well. Mm. There are challenges like inflation. Uh, inf uh, it is being faced by, uh, you know, uh, masses at large. But we, uh, we know that last year the rate of increase of inflation was, uh, you know, very rapid. And this year it has shrunk and it is uh, under control. Mm. And if the government is able to uh, nib it more, then of course we, we will see a positive effect of that as well. Uh, economy so far, it is uh, of course uh, stabilizing, but further injections from IMF, I believe uh, that would be uh, sort of, uh, you know, a good factor Breather. in coming days. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Khalid, um, at one end we talk about increasing foreign direct investment in the country, uh, we talk about increasing the, uh, increasing the volume of the economy, which in fact uh, is uh, increasing trade and business in the country, um, and uh, then we talk about increasing the tax net and taxation. Do you think there should be a balance uh, between uh, the subsidies that are granted uh, for businesses to flourish and facilitate them, and uh, the subsequent uh, taxation on uh, on the revenue that they're generating, and how can this balance be struck? You're very right. On the one hand, uh, we are looking for more revenue through taxes, but at the same time, we are also awarding certain concessions to businesses, uh -huh. to other entities from the same money. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a pseudo expenditure which the government is doing. So the idea is very uh, genuine that if we can help the businesses grow mm. because that growth should actually lead us to more economic activity and more resources then it's fine so it's a kind of a value for public money where we are letting the businesses enjoy some kind of a tax uh, exemption but it should result in some kind of a performance be it the exports be it the output be it some employment or even the tax itself but unfortunately, what we see on ground is that our businesses, not all, but most of them, has become addictive towards these sorts of concessions. And this has been now established that unfortunately, 
Pakistan is not that much competitive mm -hmm. as compared to the rest of the countries or even the region. And that is one of the reasons why our productivity is very low. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our business maestros or the owners or even the workers are not producing that kind of a value addition which they should have been. And one of the element is that we have been unfortunately pro too much protective the argument as the infant industry or mm. giving some kind of a relief for some time has actually not worked in the case of Pakistan. Yeah. So what we believe now is that the, it's the right time that we have to actually think about all sorts of subsidies to be performance oriented. There should be some performance clauses in it and there should also be some sunset clauses. Mm. No business should feel that the uh, tax exemption or reduction of their liabilities is a permanent thing. They have to actually grow themselves to become competitive and they have to earn. As uh, has been talked about, the so-called world game changer should not be in our dictionary. It should be hard work, it should be directed activities and it should always be some outcome oriented. Otherwise, we don't have uh, easy solutions. Uh. Uh, for Dafi, because we're talking about right. productivity. Uh, Dr. Mahmood, I have a question for you as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go on. Regarding the economic reform, uh, one aspect that is very important, we keep on hearing uh, every time IMF is actually in talks with Pakistan, that on one side it is asking the government of Pakistan to levy more taxes and to expand the tax base. On the other side, it also actually speaks about improving the quality or perhaps the supply of, uh, uh, you know, BISP-like programs. I understand that when, when you talk about the lower class or the most vulnerable in the society, they can be supported through BISP. But what happens to the working class, which is squeezed in the middle, and you keep on adding taxes, but there is no financial support for the working class or the middle class. Uh, why is it that the fund does not take cognizance of them at all? We have to understand is that fund is a creditor. They are not here yeah. to facilitate us, rather they are going to protect their lending. Mm -hmm. In doing so, if we have done our exercise well, if we can give them an alternative which can actually help ensure that our fiscal deficits are within the acceptable limits, our current account deficits are not uh, increasing, then they're happy. Mm -hmm. But I totally agree with your point that putting burden on the middle class, especially the salaried class which they have uh, asked from the government, we uh, vehemently oppose it. Rather, we have asked the government in the form of proposals that we should actually increase the exemption threshold. Can you imagine that right now the exemption threshold is 600,000 per annum, which means 50,000 rupees per month. And if you look and if you go to the household with the average family size of six children, 50,000 is nothing. Mm -hmm. So what we have proposed is that it should be increased to at least 800,000. It should be inflation index. But having said that, we have also proposed that the exemptions which has been given in the system, for example, the agricultural income, the retail sector and those entities which are bigger than corporations but not registered, they should be taken to task and they should be asked to give their due share. So IMF is not against any particular class or uh, against the welfare of the people. It's mm. us if we can give them a better recipe where, their, where our slippages are controlled, our state-owned enterprises are uh, actually earning rather than taking money then they would be happy because they're creditors. Mm -hmm. Right. For Padafi, what's your views? Because um, um, because we're talking about productivity, we're talking about uh, out of the box solutions, uh, considering Pakistan's economy. But um, at the same time, um, we see that uh, with, with these out of the box solutions and with these come there are different challenges. How do you think the government can address specifically when we talk about quick revenue generation? Uh, and uh, we talk about um, increasing employment opportunities and business opportunities in the country. Right, uh, Rafi, there's a concern here. Uh, you see, there, there seems to be a competing value at play. 
when you talk about uh, reforms in the economy, usually it comes at the cost of growth because uh, the government of Pakistan cannot spend that much money on developmental projects which usually create the kind of capacity that is needed for growth. And then, of course, you have to actually levy, levy more taxes and because of that, growth actually suffers. So if you want to actually fix the economy, then you'll have to, first of all, ensure that you go through the reforms that you have committed without hoping to immediately see some kind of roots of that tree. But the problem with my understanding of this situation is how many times have we gone to the IMF? And every time we have committed to the, the moon and the sun and whatnot, and then either we uh, fall off the wagon or then even, even when we fulfill everything, uh, even then our solutions are temporary. Uh, we keep on increasing the GST. We, we might try to tax those who are already taxed, automatic taxes on the salaried class, um, a few other uh, industries which are registered but we are not actually going through the whole process. And then when you talk about developmental projects like PSDP, their uh, IMF's own report actually says that, uh, you know, uh, one project uh, in developmental sector actually takes more than 12 years to material materialize. And then when we look at the numbers, a lot of uh, funds that are given to various departments by the end of fiscal year, the lapse. So we have some serious, uh, you know, issues with our own bureaucracy and the way everything is managed. So we'll have to actually take a serious look at how, how to run the country until the time we are not done with the reforms. All, all this uh, boom and bust cycle, all these reforms that we commit to will only mean so much. Because remember, in the war on terror, so much money came to Pakistan. But where did it go? We don't have, uh, uh, because the entire administration was a broken vessel, things actually uh, went to slippages and uh, wastage. Similarly, uh, when you talk about CPAC, how many times have we spoken about uh, CPAC? Right? At that time, it was thought that it is immediately going to transform everything. But the other side is doing what they can. We have to ensure that we also are able to get the benefits that are needed. So with that kind of a problem, I think reforms will take some time. And once we have actually done serious reforms, especially low-hanging fruits like selling off SOEs, then perhaps we can start thinking about creation of jobs and finding more solutions. With your permission, yes. uh, I wanted to ask a question, uh, obviously. Uh, Dr. Mahmood, uh, when we talk about, you know, industry, uh, industry is a sort of backbone of uh, any economy. As, and we know that uh, in recent decades, Pakistan's industry, uh, rather than improving itself, it was actually declining uh, due to the pressures of, uh, you know, lack of uh, energy uh, resources in Pakistan. And then, uh, of course, uh, 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 there is uh, uh, another thing that the exports, they were affected. The, the FDIs into different industries, it saw a decline in terms of, uh, you know, uh, investors. They were not considering Pakistan as to be one of the favorite uh, destinations for investing money. Reason largely is of course, Pakistan was fighting war on terrorism. And, of course, uh, during that time, Pakistan lost. And, uh, uh, you know, there are estimates that $220 billion of uh, Pakistan's economy we have lost in war on terror. In this context, I mean, in coming uh, years, uh, do you see uh, sort of uh, this situation improving, especially the small uh, uh, industry sector. We know cities like Faisalabad, um, Gujranwala, Sialkot, there are many small uh, industries uh, and this sector is pivotal when it comes to, you know, um, uh, extending fruits of your economy 
to the, the very uh, lower levels of uh, the population we know, uh, they are uh, of course affected right now and the joblessness uh, regarding and related to these sectors, it is affected. In coming years, how to overcome this, knowing the challenges that if we go for, uh, you know, consuming uh, sort of uh, energy resources from our uh, friendly countries, uh, uh, neighborly countries like Iran, then our friendly countries like America, they actually simply say that we have the reservations, you can't go to them, uh, you know, seeking uh, a park Iran uh, a gas pipeline because it is needed to fuel Pakistan, to to energize Pakistan's economy, to energize Pakistan's household and the industrial se sectors as well. In coming future, how would we overcome these kind of challenges? Well, to be very honest, if the same sort of set of policies and administration goes on, then there is no hope. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if you look at the history those sectors which were not under the regulations of the government have been surviving and they have been growing. Mm. Take for example the IT sector. That grew because there was less regulation and they were allowed to breathe. Mm. Unfortunately, the current state of the regulatory burden on all businesses is so high, I agree to this point that there are supply constraints such as energy or uh, the uh, other source of supplies which could have benefited us. But what we can think about is that if we can let the businesses breathe. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a quick example. To date, uh, there are close to just 500 firms which are listed in the stock market. Mm -hmm. The businesses don't like to corporatize because they know that if they corporatize or grow, then mm -hmm. the tax regime would be further choking them down. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, there are so many permissions which has to be taken to initiate businesses. Virtually, we don't find any new innovation or R&D coming up because they know that if they try to do something, they would be put to ask for more documentation or taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, the simplest solution is that we have to create room for these businesses. We have to think about the domestic commerce. Mm -hmm. The quickest solution is stop asking for too much documentation. Create some easiness for them. Mm. I'll give you a quick example. If you compare across the world, the tax matters on average take around 100 hours for an ordinary business. Mm. In case of Pakistan, that's close to 600 hours. Mm. So that's that right. is a kind of choking the businesses which are not allowing them to grow. Mm. And on top of that, as Farooq has rightly mentioned, that the lust for more revenue is then looking towards those businesses which are easy to uh, clamp on more taxes, which is a bad approach because that is not going to only hurt their productivity, but also the approach towards businesses where they might start thinking about closing their businesses, getting to smaller units or trying to evade taxes. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about an environment where we are trying to facilitate the business, mm -hmm. where we are really thinking that these are the potentials. I totally agree that the foreign direct investment is going to help and the external help is necessary. Mm -hmm. But until unless our domestic investor rise to the equation, mm -hmm. they also start investing. No investor from the rest of the world would be confident to come here because it's your own economy strength Hmm. which attracts more resources from outside. So we have to be very critical about that. Hmm. Right, um, and Dr. Mahmood, uh, there's also one, uh, one other aspect that you mentioned in the start of the conversation uh, regarding climate resilience and uh, because there was mention, uh, as the finance minister mentioned, uh, that after the loan program has been, um, has been matured upon, um, there will be a request for additional funding under the Resilience and Sustainable Trust. And that we know Pakistan has an agrarian economy and we know that the floods we saw in 2022, they had uh, a very, very devastating impact on the country's agriculture. We saw the floods, they wreaked havoc. 
uh, whether it be livestock, whether it be crops, or whether it be the land itself, the soil itself, it was uh, very impacted due to these floods. Uh, with that, what would you say about climate justice uh, in terms of Pakistan's economy? Because we have suffered losses uh, due to the effects of climate change. But of course, Pakistan doesn't contribute in the carbon emissions as much. Yeah, and uh, uh, Do Dr. Mahmood, uh, just to add uh, to it, uh, when we talk about uh, you know climate justice, the kind of money which was, uh, of course, promised to us in, in shape of uh, climate uh, compensation, which we, of course, uh, you know, seeked from the uh, uh, rest of the world, when would we be starting to get get it and would it be the sector wise that they they will uh, you know tell us to you can only fix this money for this sector and that money for that sector and you're not allowed to uh, sort of uh, you know utilize this money for your own sake or something like that i'll come to the last question first mm. look money is always fungible if we mm. get more resources from some part then the resources which we had parked for the same activity can be released. Mm -hmm. So any financial help is going to help us spend more on other desirable projects. So, for, so that is clear. Mm -hmm. Now on the other part, that is where the global south and the global north debate actually comes in. Yeah. This is where we lack as a whole developing countries uh, what we call as the group, not just Pakistan as an individual country. Mm -hmm. that we have been unable to actually lock into the commitments which were made in the Paris Climate mm -hmm. Agreement in terms of the climate uh, related uh, uh, thresholds. It's not just about financing, mm -hmm. it's also the devastation which is coming because of the climate change happening. Mm -hmm. Even if the funding doesn't come, but at least those countries which are emitting more, if they can stop, that would also help us. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, you are very right that these were the commitments which were made by the Global North because these are related to the technologies which are going to help the whole globe and mm. at the same time help us mitigate. Mm. It's not just about floods, mm. it's about heat waves. Mm. It is about a number of things which are related to the plants, that how the vegetation is actually changing because of the climate changes and so many other things. Mm. So we as a small country cannot withstand all those crises. And unfortunately, on the other side of the table, there is no uh, wake-up call happening because as a group, we have been failing. Mm -hmm. But we need to push it further. And this is the kind of agenda which should be talked about along with other things because for us, it's consequential. Mm -hmm. uh, Dafi, what's your views on uh, climate justice uh, that needs to be done? And of course, um, uh, we know that uh, Pakistan's agrarian economy has suffered massively due to it. Uh, and we saw commitments made earlier as well. Uh, but they haven't matured as of yet. And um, uh, with that, uh, Pakistan still has suffered those losses. Um, what's your take on how the country has had to deal uh, with these effects of climate change, uh, even though it hasn't contributed as much to it? Right. Uh, thank you again. For, uh, this is a beautiful question because there's a lot of misunderstanding regarding this issue. Whatever or most of what was committed at Geneva was essentially pledges, right? And uh, a lot of them came from uh, international financial institutions. So most of them actually come with certain roadmap or certain demands uh, what to do, and then those monies can be unlocked gradually. So I think that in many aspects, uh, well, we are in that uh, moving in that, uh, that direction. And in coming days, we are going to see further movement as well. But uh, when you talk about those pledges, and then you actually think that it has anything to do with climate justice, then we have lost the plot. Because uh, uh, even if you keep on talking about climate justice, when you talk about the developed countries, they pay a lot of lip service, but even loss and damages fund that was to be established so, so many years ago could not be established for such a long time. So uh, any country that has any kind of leeway or leverage, they, why would you, they listen to anyone else? And that's why we have seen that uh, the entire climate debate has become uh, you know, a talking point uh, among those who actually are the biggest polluters. And we haven't seen the kind of changes that were needed. So if you think that you're 
of course, Pakistan is an important country, and Pakistan is going to get uh, whatever was pledged. But if you are thinking that there is going to be any kind of justice that is going to be delivered, I don't think that the world is ready for that at all. You know, petrochemicals will continue with those chemicals and the kind of pollution that is created uh, around the world. You know, no country or no businessman would want to, uh, you know, uh, concede any kind of ground. They will keep on talking about the importance of climate. But then when it comes to countries that have suffered like Pakistan, all you can get is uh, loans or some uh, grants and uh, there will be a lot of fanfare whenever that is delivered. This is how our, our broken world is and that is not going to change very quickly. With your permission, I just wanted Thanks. to add another thing, you know, uh, very frankly, I mean, uh, if, we, uh, if we look at how uh, these organizations, when they give uh, money in terms of, of course, uh, climate related disasters and all, uh, they have a certain uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, modus operandi through which they would say, okay, uh, the surveyors, they would be, you know, we will suggest you which surveyors you are going to choose and there will be teams coming from New York or coming from elsewhere to come to Pakistan and do the, conduct the surveys and that survey would take around uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have actually been to uh, Balochistan, been to uh, Sindh when the floods actually came to Pakistan and I know people on ground, they lost their livestock. I mean, majority of the people, of course, they were still, uh, you know, right in the middle of uh, uh, water. And uh, the, the remainings, they were crying, sitting on the uh, 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 sort of uh, mountains or high hills. Mm -hmm. And they were crying that the only source of income they had, it was a buffalo or a cow or a, a few sheep. All of them, in the flash flooding, all of them, they were gone. R them people, I mean, their life was... Uh, a huge disaster for them at that time. To me, when uh, you know all of these uh, uh, organizations, they send money like this, that uh, with the sort of uh, you know that you have to do this and you have to do that, and then this survey would be conducted by them, and uh, that uh, uh, thing would be done by this company, and that thing would be done by that that company. Hmm. What it shows, it shows that the money they just want to take out from one of their pockets and put it in w uh, the other pocket. And that's what they are doing. This is called the vultures coming on the dead. And this is what is happening. I mean, people on the ground, probably they won't be uh, getting any benefits out of it, seriously. It's not just about climate funding. It's all right. the I, all I of the agree donations. with the idea that uh, there is a lack of transparency when it comes to these, uh, you know, projects because international governmental organizations function in a very peculiar way. But as someone who has actually, uh, you know, Faisal was talking about uh, places which were impacted, let me add to the list my own village. You know, my own father's grave in my village was underwater for one whole year. And, and the fact is that we have seen climate change with our own uh, eyes uh, and we have seen its impact. But the problem is that when you talk to these donors, the whole system is so convoluted, as Faisal was pointing out. Uh, it is not easy to get uh, the fair share either. But we have to keep on pressing on and demand some kind of uh, uh, further commitment so that we can have some kind of benefit in the country. But then government of Pakistan also has to match up and ensure that those reforms that we committed are implemented related to climate change on ground. Well, transparency should be ensured and coordinated efforts should be also ensured regarding uh, tackling the issue of climate change and of course providing climate justice to those uh, vulnerable communities that are affected by this phenomena. With that, we'll have to move towards the second segment. Uh, and of course, a talk about elections in India. If we, if we talk about a brief sum up of uh, the recent developments that have unfolded there, uh, the Aam Aadmi Party Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kajriwal was granted bail by India's apex court. And this is a boost to the opposition's uh, campaign, the electoral campaigns in India, the Grand India Alliance that we're seeing. 
Um, with that, we see on the one end there's the BJP, on the other end uh, there's a grand alliance by the most of India's political parties and uh, which is being headed by the Congress. Uh, on the one end, there's talk of uh, the Hindutva and RSS ideology. On the other end, uh, the India Alliance is talking about economy and um, preserving the secular essence of the Indian constitution. But with that, we've also seen reports coming out and voices uh, that are being raised regarding uh, the marginalization, uh, the, the atrocities co being committed against the marginalized segments and how uh, the minority communities in India are being marginalized and with also the human rights abuses that we're seeing regarding uh, the minority segments in India. Uh, Rajiv Faisal, what's your take? How do you see uh, it all unfolding in India? Because we also saw there were, there were clashes in the Manipur area, uh, ethnic clashes there. We've seen uh, the, the um, um, uh, targeting of uh, Muslim communities. We've also seen the targeting of Sikhs in India. What does that say about the human rights situation in India? You know, when we talk about BJP and Modi, of course, they keep on uh, uh, keeping busy their country, especially the minorities in these, these kind of, uh, uh, you know, gimmicks. Mm. Uh, when we talk about Manipur, of course, it was the Kurki tribe and Methi tribe, and uh, we know that Methi was aligned with the center, and they were, of course, uh, uh, raging a havoc against the Kurki tribes because Kurki tribe was not Hindu. Mm. And this is what was taking place out there. When we talk about, of course, uh, you know, uh, New Delhi and uh, uh, places like Agra and uh, UP, uh, mosque after a mosque, it's been, uh, you know, demolished and, of course, vandalized and uh, their uh, uh, goons and hooligans, they are on the roads and they are uh, active against uh, Islam because they believe that this is uh, a sort of a charged, charged up slogan, Jai Shri Ram. Uh, mm. Through these kind of slogans, they can get votes, and this has been taking place. But there is another place, it is Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir that we shouldn't be forgetting, and that is related to, I mean, I was, I was going through one of the cases, a very recent, uh, uh, you know, statements coming out from uh, 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 India as, uh, itself, and the case of, uh, you know, Yasin Malik. Yasin mm. Malik, I mean, they booked him in a case that was 30 year old case and the act which they are using is NIA Act 2008 and we know that uh, Yasin Malik's 11 year old daughter Razia Sultana and his wife, a young wife Mushal Malik, both of them they have been going throughout the world seeking justice, seeking justice for Yasin Malik and what kind of justice is being delivered uh, to him in India? I mean, uh, it is no different to rest of the Muslims, uh, which they are uh, getting from uh, BJP mm. ruled uh, government. And of course, we are seeing that India has this set pattern in which, uh, uh, especially since 2014, we have been seeing that the butcher of Gujarat, as soon as he took the premier position in India, he made sure that he uh, brought same uh, uh, manners on the larger level. And we have been seeing that. And that is why, uh, you know, in today's uh, India, minorities, especially Muslims, they are being marginalized. And uh, in coming future, I mean, uh, uh, owing to the coming up election, the kind of election which is being, uh, you know, conducted out there, uh, I believe um, not at a very uh, powerful level uh, government, but still BJP will be coming uh, with uh, another government, another term. Mm. And in that term, what they do, it would be seen in coming days. But mm. let's wait. Right, um, Dr. Mahmood, um, co considering you, you have expertise in the economic spheres, we've also, we were also seeing different reports coming out um, uh, from Al Jazeera, from different media outlets, considering the economic situation in India. They say the in, in unemployment rate has, um, has gone to a new high there. And um, uh, there's, there's a different, uh, s uh, there's actually a very large population that, that's the literate population of India that is unemployed at the moment and the youth uh, there do not have opportunities uh, to excel and um, earn a livelihood. Uh, how do you sum up uh, the economic situation in India so far? Do you think um, uh, it has been exposed as how it was being projected as going towards a very positive trajectory and uh, now the real numbers have come to fall? Well, actually, if you look from the top, then it might look good, but if you go into the details, then you find out that the marginalized segments actually, the deprived people as you have just mentioned, the lower strata which doesn't get quality jobs 
at the same time the increase in the poverty rates that actually sh shows the fissures in the overall economic system which sort of uh, reflects the capitalist kind of a society mm -hmm. we talk about the ambanis and the others now these are the kinds of persons which are taking away most of the economic gains which are there mm -hmm. and the rest of the society are actually not made part of all those benefits so this is something which has come out not just uh, by the international reports, by their own analyst as well, mm. that the ro the growth which they are facing now is not equitable. It does not do justice with the rest of the society. So it's kind of uh, redistribution coming from the poor towards the top. So that is the kind of scenario which is happening there. Right, uh, Farooq Badawi, what's your views considering uh, the um, uh, the Delhi Chief Minister's uh, bail uh, granted by the Apex Court today? It's a boost to the opposition's campaign. How would you sum uh, today's development? Right. Uh, thank you very much again. It is a very good question because Arvind Kajriwal and his party actually emerged out of a huge movement that was against corruption, right? And then because the, these were the people who were coming out of, uh, you know, uh, Congress party, they actually, whenever they spoke against corruption, they actively uh, ended up undermining Congress, not BJP. And this time, what BJP has done is by arresting Arvind Kajriwal, he has united all the dis uh, disparate forces. And now the India Alliance has all the intellectual capital that is needed to actually try to bring down um, Narendra Modi's government. And then remember that while Arvind Kajriwal was being arrested, at that time, electoral bonds was a huge scam that was unfolding. Then uh, came Karnataka's, uh, you know, rape, uh, mass rape story. And everything actually ends up with, the, uh, you know, BJP. So I think that uh, now that Arvind Kejriwal has come out uh, of the prison and he actually adds his weight to the campaign, I'm sure that uh, the momentum is further going to be built. One of the big tells of how bad it is for the uh, dueling BJP is the way, uh, uh, you know, India's Prime Minister keeps on making gaffes upon gaffes. Sometimes he is talking about Mangal Sutra, sometimes he is talking about buffaloes being stolen by Congress, and then he talks about Adani and Ambani, the people who have been his mentors, his supporters, that they are stashing black uh, cash or black money and sending it to Congress. So I think in the short period of time, uh, uh, Modi has managed to alienate everybody. And it is go going to cost him a lot. And uh, uh, Kejri Ball's release well, we'll is a welcome step in that mm -hmm. direction. Well, that's, that's something we'll have to see as time unfolds. Uh, well, with that, uh, that's all the time we had for today. We discussed different aspects regarding Pakistan and IMF talks and the election situation in India. Uh, I'd like to thank all our participants of the discussion that we had today. See you same time on Monday. Till then, have a great weekend and take care.